Hello, and welcome to this online tutorial on refeeding syndrome. Today we're going to take a look at how to identify these patients, as well as the best ways to treat them. When you stop this recording, please take a moment to leave a comment on what you thought about this presentation, and also what you learned. So let's take a look at the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome. What is refeeding syndrome? Well, it's a potentially fatal consequence triggered by aggressive oral, enteral, or parenteral carbohydrate feeding following a period of nutritional deprivation. Due to the sudden influx of glucose into the cells, which have previously adapted to a low glucose metabolism, the malnourished body's regulatory processes become quickly overwhelmed, and the extracellular reserves of potassium, phosphate, and magnesium become quickly depleted. Movement of these minerals into the intracellular compartment causes blood concentrations to become extremely low, which can lead to cardiac arrest, neuromuscular complications, and respiratory dysfunction. So it's very important that when we're treating these patients and refeeding them, that we do it purposefully and slowly to avoid these complications. Let's now take a look at the patients at risk for refeeding syndrome. Common characteristics of these patients include adaptation to malnutrition and low glucose utilization. A third of all enterally fed cancer patients experience refeeding syndrome. It may be wise to pause this recording and think about the patient populations listed on this screen. That way, by reflecting on these groups now, we hope that in the future you'll be able to recall refeeding syndrome as a potential risk factor when you see these patients in clinical settings. So how do we identify patients at risk for refeeding syndrome? Patients either need to display one or more of the following, a BMI under 16, unintentional weight loss of more than 15% of body weight in less than six months, or more than 7.5% in three months, or more than 5% in one month, a low nutritional intake for seven to 10 days, and laboratory indices such as low potassium, magnesium, phosphate prefeeding, and low serum prealbumin. Or patients need to display two or more of the following. A BMI under 18.5, unintentional weight loss of more than 10% of the body weight in less than six months, little to no food consumed for five days, and an excessive use of alcohol, diuretics, antiacids, and chemotherapy. So let's take a look at how to prevent refeeding syndrome. Patients should not receive more than 20% above their basal energy expenditure. Typically, we want to dose around 1,000 calories per day and gradually increase over one week. Next, patients should avoid excess glucose with no more than 2 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per minute. So that's around 200 grams per day. And take note that even a 5% dextrose solution for enteral feeding can precipitate refeeding syndrome, so definitely be wary of that. We also want to ensure electrolyte stability for the first week of treatment, limit fluid intake to about 800 to 1,000 milliliters a day, avoid excessive sodium to prevent edema, and also provide a thiamine supplement. If your patient is gaining over 1 kilogram a week, this may indicate fluid retention. So this concludes our tutorial on refeeding syndrome. For further information on topics relating to clinical presentation of refeeding syndrome, repletion guidelines for phosphate, magnesium, and potassium, and for some case studies on practicing identifying, treating, and preventing refeeding syndrome, go to our website at www.nutritionandmedicine.org. It only takes a couple minutes, and then you'll be registered for free access to any of our online educational materials. Thanks for listening and check back for more tutorials in the near future.